Our Bible reading this morning is from the prophet Micah, Micah 6, verses 1 through 8. Micah 6, 1 through 8, that is found on page 1,452 in your pew Bibles. And girls, you'll know that uh, Micah 6, verse 8, of course, is your theme verse. So I wrote this sermon with you guys in mind, which means I, I, I try to talk a little bit to younger people. So I'm trying to, this sermon, I'm, I would say it's aimed at someone who's like 10 years old. So I know some of you are older than 10, and some of you are younger than 10, but I try to aim it at someone who's about 10 years old. Now, a lot of the people out there, are they 10 years old? No, they're a little past that. But, you know what? Every single one of you uh, knows what it's like to be 10. So uh, listen to this sermon with that 10-year-old childlike part of yourself. Unless, of course, you're 8 or 9, and then you've got a little bit to wait. Let's hear what the prophet Micah says. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up. Plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He's lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you out of Egypt. I redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you and Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted? What Balaam, son of Beor, answered? Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal? That you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord? And bow down before the exalted God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. So I, I want to start this morning with ballroom dancing. I want to start with ballroom dancing. Now, I don't know if you girls know ballroom dancing. It's really a, a, a kind of dancing that's more for older people. But at least you have a chance to have maybe seen it because some shows like Dancing with the Stars have started to make... Um, ballroom dancing more popular. And ballroom dancing is when two people, a um, man and a woman, will, will dance around on a dance floor and they'll dance to some, there's some sort of classic dances that they will do when they do ballroom dancing. So there's a dance called the Foxtrot and there's a dance called the Tango and there's a dance called the Waltz. And if you're going to dance these th dances, you got to learn the steps of those dances. Each of those dances have very specific steps that you need to learn to follow. So for example, the waltz. The waltz musically is in three, right? You all know that? One, two, three, one, two, three, oom pa pa, oom pa pa, okay? And because it's in three, there are three steps to the waltz, and I'm gonna do those steps right here. I learned them on YouTube this week, <laughs> okay? And you first go forward with your left, and then you slide with your right, and then you go back, and you bring your left back to your right, and you go back with your right, not too far, <laughs> and you slide with your left, and you come together with the right foot. That's the waltz. One, two, three, one, two, three. Now, of course, you don't just do this by yourself. The waltz is danced with someone else, so there's someone else in front of you who's doing the same steps. So that means it's really, really important that you do this together with your partner. So when their foot goes forward, your foot goes backwards. And when their foot goes backwards, your foot goes forwards because if they're going in the opposite direction, you don't have a dance, you have a mess, right? You step on each other's feet, you bump into each other, and it looks less like dancing and more like wrestling, as many of us unfortunately know. But, and, I, and maybe you've never seen it, 
Many of you have. When two people learn to waltz, when they do the steps right, when they're good at it, it's beautiful to watch. They just float around the dance floor. It is so graceful. It is good and it is beautiful. Now, why am I talking about waltzes? This is church, not dance class. I should be talking about Micah. 70 years ago, maybe you girls don't even know this, we weren't even allowed to dance in this denomination. Now I'm dancing on the pulpit. <laughs> My Dutch mother would say, who is it mogelijk? <laughs> Here's why. Because I think in your passage, the passage you've been learning all year, in the passage I just read, what God is doing is he holding his hands out to us and he's inviting us to dance. Maybe you haven't thought of it that way. In this passage, God is holding his hand out to the people of Israel and he's inviting them to dance. He's saying, come on people, dance with me. Learn my steps. Because if you learn my steps and you dance with me in your life, it will be good and it will be beautiful. Now, when I was reading, maybe you noticed that this, when God asked him to dance, it's not a typical ask, right? If you go to a dance, most of the time when someone asks you to dance, it's something cheerful. They say, would you like to dance with me? It's friendly. God is not, he's a little annoyed in this passage. Maybe you could hear that in my words. And he's annoyed with them, so when he asks, it's more like, come on, dance with me. And he asks that way because he's been asking his people to dance for years after year after year. And he's saying, come on, you people, you're meant to dance with me. You're meant to, to dance with me on the dance floor, but you keep pushing me away. Either the people of Israel refuse to dance, or when they dance, they want to go their own way. They don't want to follow God's steps. They end up stepping on his toes and bumping into him and pushing him away. And so God is frustrated. And he says, come on, dance. Come on, I want to dance with you. And God is doing more than asking them. He's also teaching them how to dance. In Micah 6, verse 8, the passage you know so well, God is teaching you guys, all of us, Israel, the steps of his dance. And these are the steps. Act justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. Act justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. See, it's a dance in three. It's just like a waltz. If we learn those steps, and we learn to dance them with God, it will be good, and it will be beautiful, and we will flourish, and life will be good. If we fight God, if we don't learn those steps, if we go in the opposite way, we will be miserable, the people around us will be miserable, and God will not be pleased. So I want to think today about how to do those steps, those three steps that I just talked about. Because God is inviting all of us to dance with him. How do we do those steps? What do those steps look like? Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly. And to do that, I want to think about women. Women in the Bible who are really good at dancing. Some women in the Bible who think stories that you probably know, some of which, not all, but some of which I think you've studied this year. These women were really good at dancing those steps. So I want to think about their story so that we can learn what it means to do this dance with God. Okay, so the first step is God calls us to act justly. What does that mean? What's that step about? Well, when we act justly, it's all about fairness. We are acting justly. We want to be fair with everyone, no matter who they are. So in our classes, we don't treat someone who's attractive any differently than someone who's plain. We don't treat someone who's popular any different from someone who doesn't have a lot of friends. We don't treat someone who's rich any different than someone who doesn't have much money at all, right? We're fair. We treat everyone equally. And so that's part of what it means to act justly. But in the Bible, it also means more. Because there are certain people who are weak, right? And those are the kinds of people who get picked on. And God is really concerned about them. The orphan, the widow, the stranger. So God wants us to think about those people and to watch those people. And if they're not being treated fairly, he wants us to speak out and say something. When I think of someone, a woman in the Bible who danced that step really well, I think of the story of Esther. 
So Esther was a Jewish person. She was a child of God, but she was also a queen. She was a queen in Persia. She was married to Xerxes, the most powerful man, the richest man in the, in the, in the world at that time. So that meant, as a queen, Esther had a pretty good life, right? She lived in a palace. She had lots of servants. She had whatever she wanted, she got. She had a cushy life. But Esther was restless because she knew there was injustice. The people of Israel, her people, were being treated badly. There was a man named Haman who was trying to get a law passed that all the Jewish people should be destroyed, that they should be killed. And Esther knew that was wrong. But it was hard for her to speak out because she was a queen and she knew there was powerful people against her. If she, she spoke out, she could lose everything. The king could say, you're not queen anymore. She could lose all the servants and all the money and all the stuff. They could even kill her. But even though she had a lot to lose, she stepped forward and she said to the king, this is no good. What Haman is doing is unjust. This is not fair. And I think you know what happened. It worked, right? The people were saved. Esther acted justly. Esther was a person who knew the first step of the dance. And when she danced, it was good and it was beautiful. Which brings us to the second step of the dance, which is to love mercy. Now, what does that mean, to love mercy? Now, mercy, the Hebrew word that gets translated mercy is a famous word, and it's a word I've talked to some of you in a children's sermon about before. It's the word chesed. Have you heard of that word? Chesed. That word gets, all, it's all through the Old Testament, really important word. It gets translated in all sorts of ways. Sometimes it's mercy. Sometimes it's kindness. Sometimes it's love. Sometimes it's steadfast love. So what is God asking us to do when he asks us to love chesed? Well, a good way to figure that out is to watch how God dances when he does chesed. Because in, in the Bible, God is often the one doing chesed. All right? And, and what, is, what does God's chesed look like? Well, it looks like this. It's a love that doesn't give up. It's a love that keeps going over a long time and loves someone even when they're difficult. It doesn't give up. It loves someone for a long time. And when it loves someone, it gives them more than they deserve. You love them and you don't just give what they gave you, you give more back. So, so chesed doesn't just say, well, you love me this much, so I'm only going to love you this much. You only love me five, I'm only going to love you five. Chesed says, you love me five, I'm still going to love you a thousand. So chesed keeps going over a long time and gives a person more than they deserve. When I think of a woman from the Bible who showed chesed, I think of Ruth. Now, Ruth was not an Israelite. She was from a country named Moab. And I think most of you know, people in Israel did not like people from Moab. They did not like them at all. But Ruth ended up living in Israel, in Bethlehem, in fact. And here's how that happened. She used to live in Moab, and there she met a Jewish person named Naomi, and she married her son. But what happened there is that Naomi's husband died and Ruth's husband died, and it was just her and Naomi left. And Naomi said, I'm going back to Israel, to Bethlehem. Now, life was going to be hard for Naomi there because she was an older woman and she didn't have anything. So she was going to be incredibly poor. She would have nothing. So what Ruth did is she said, I will go with you. I will help you. That was chesed when Ruth did that. And when she did it, she loved Naomi over a long period of time. Naomi, after her husband died, was pretty crabby. But Ruth kept loving her through that. Kept going over a long time. And Ruth gave her more than she deserved, right? She didn't need to do that. She could have stayed in Moab, but she went. Ruth showed mercy. She loved mercy. She danced that second step of the dance. And when she did, it was good and it was beautiful. Finally, the last step of the dance. God calls us to walk humbly with him. What is that about? Well, that has to do with who leads the dance. So in, in, a, in ballroom dancing, somebody's got to lead, right? 
Someone's got to step decide when to step forward. Someone's got to start and decide when to step back. Someone's got to decide we're turning this way. Someone's got to decide we're turning that way. And, and the person who leads sort of makes the path all over the dance floor. That's how it works in ballroom dancing. When you're a Christian, our life, I could all tell you this, is like a dance where God leads. God is the one who starts the steps and we follow. And sometimes... He turns in a way that we don't expect. Sometimes he turns and takes you on a part of the dance floor that you're not sure you want to go on. And you say, Lord, this is scary. But when you, when you walk humbly, you say, I know this is a scary spot, but I trust you, Lord, so I'm going to follow your lead. When I think of someone in the Bible who danced this step well, I think of Mary. Mary was only about 14. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was only about 14 when the angel came to her in that famous story. But she was engaged. She was going to be married. So I am sure, like all married people, she had a plan of what her life was going to look like. And it was probably something like this. Oh, he's a carpenter. We're going to, he's going to build me a home by the Sea of Galilee. We're going to have a white picket fence. I'm going to have a garden. I'm going to work in the market every day. It will be so great. We'll have kids. And the angel tells up and says, you're pregnant. And it's a miracle. And not only that, the baby you're going to have is going to be the Messiah. Right? There goes the white picket fence. Right? She's not going to have that home by the Sea of Galilee. Her life is going to be very, very different. A lot of people would have said, ah, I don't want to do that. Lord, I'm not going to do it. But what did Mary say? I don't know if you remember. I am the Lord's servant. I will do whatever you ask me. Lord, I don't know where this dance is leading. I don't like where you just turned. I don't like where you're taking me on the dance floor. But I trust you, and I will walk humbly with you. Mary walked humbly with her God. She was really good at that third step of the dance. And when she danced, it was good and it was beautiful. And God used her, of course, to bring Jesus into the world, our Savior. We can say more about that baby that Jesus had. He was pretty special, right? He was God on earth. He was a son of God. So God came to live among us in Jesus. And what did Jesus do when he walked the earth? What was he doing? Well, you could say it this way. He was holding his hands out to us and saying, dance with me. Dance with me. I want to teach you my father's ways. Come on, dance with me and I will show you my father's ways and it will be good and it will be beautiful. And Jesus was a really good dancer. He danced all up through Galilee and he told amazing stories and did miracles. He danced down into Jerusalem and he spoke truth to power and he did marvelous things. And all the while he said, come on, dance with me. He held out his hand. And then what did we people do? We took his hand and we nailed it to a cross. We crucified him. And even then, even when he was being crucified, Jesus kept dancing. He kept showing mercy. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And what he did saved the world and saved our lives. And in so doing, even though we who have such a hard time picking up this dance and learning it, through his sacrifice, the Holy Spirit gets placed in our hearts. So even though we have a hard time learning this dance, we know because we belong to Jesus and his spirit has been put in our hearts that we have the dance in us and someday we will dance this dance perfectly. So this whole year, you girls have been studying that verse. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly. And your teachers have been going through lessons and you've been learning things whether you realize it or not, through every single one of these lessons, Jesus has been holding his hand out to you and saying, come on, dance with me. I hope you will dance with him. I hope that you will learn his steps. Because when you do, if it becomes the dance of your whole life, it is good and it is beautiful. Amen. Lord, we know that we're all uh, slow to pick up this dance. 
we are so slow to learn your ways, and, and so many times, Lord, we go in the opposite direction. We thank you for the, the sacrifice and testimony of Jesus, for the sending of your Holy Spirit that teaches us his rhythm and teaches us his ways. Lord, this week and through the rest of our lives, help us to walk your steps and dance your dance. In Christ's name I pray it. Amen.